My name is Patrick Cole Brinson Jr. My name is John Guerra. I'm Rashawn Davis. And I played basketball at Central from 2016 to 2019. I played at North Carolina Central for two and a half years. I played here in the 2016, 17, and 2018, 19 year. Val Moten, uh, 1992 to 1996. I uh, became a head coach at North Carolina Central in March In 2012, North Carolina Central University had been established as a member of the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference for two years at the Division I level. After rejoining the conference, it helped found following a transition from the Division II level. Entering the 2012-13 season, the Eagles had gone 20-12 in league games and then shocked the conference by going 15-1 to claim the number two seed in the 2013 MEAC tournament. The Eagles were stopped short in the quarterfinal round, but little did they know how close they were to opening the door to continued success. It's been a really special run for this Eagle club over these last few years. I want to start back in the 2013-2014 season. You have uh, Pooby Chapman and Jeremy Ingram on that team together. Going into that year, did you sense there was something special about that team? You know, that, that year was, was memorable um, because the previous year we had lost in the um, first round of the MEAC tournament. And I just remember the, the pain and the humiliation that was associated with it. And then on top of that, to add um, harm to, to the situation, we had our reigning player of the year for the following year come in in June and say he's going to transfer. So that kind of broke the spirits of people um, that was surrounding the program and surrounding the team because we were all had the next year mentality. I thought when he transferred, I thought what happened, it really bonded the group. So that summer, uh, KJ Javar just really stepped up. Um, he said, listen, I'm gonna fill this vacancy and um, I'm gonna make sure this team can rally around me and I'm gonna provide the appropriate leadership that's required for us to be successful. And I knew it was special from preseason the way they held each other accountable, the way they policed one another, the leadership. And I always thought, you know, it's human nature for experience is always the best teacher. You know, it's one thing as a coach to be talking and telling them what's about to happen if you do this and what's going to happen if you don't do this. But, you know, once you go through it and you kind of taste your own blood a little bit, it awakens you. During that 2013-14 season, you had one of the most defining moments of the program history so far when you beat NC State at PNC Arena. What do you remember about that game? The summer when we scheduled it, Poopy Chapman walked in my office and said, oh, we got NC State? Yeah, I'm def we definitely win in that game. And, you know, a lot of times kids say things, but they don't sound convicted in their beliefs. He sounded convicted. He was hurt and he was, he was upset, man. Those guys just walked around with a chip on their shoulder all year. So I remember going into uh, PNC um, and I just thought if we played well, I told him before we left, I said, listen, if we do what we supposed to do, we're going to win this basketball game. We led from start to finish, and I remember them hitting a three-pointer to tie it up in, at the end of overtime. I mean, at the end of regulation. And you, it's human nature to, just for your mind to go back 
to a place. I think the previous year we had lost to Oklahoma the same way. You know, they, they hit a three-pointer to tie it up, and I'm like, wow, here we go again. Like, yo, this can't be happening again. And KJ looked me dead in my face in overtime and said, Coach, don't worry. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, we're going to win this game. And just seeing that in his eyes, you know, it, it, it lifted my spirits. And uh, I think we outscored him 12-2 to two in overtime. And, you know, it was a monumental win for, you know, the program and just the community at large. And I think it was the victory that really put North Carolina Central on the map. Credit to them. Obviously, it's a huge win for North Carolina Central University, um, every low major program, every HBCU. Um, you know, hopefully they can look at this and feel inspired. The Eagles once again posted a 15-1 and mark in conference play in 2013-14, but after feeling the sting from last year, vowed not to feel the same way again. The Eagles stormed through the quarterfinal and semifinal by defeating Howard by 46 points, 92-46, and followed that with a 23-point win over local favorite Norfolk State. Eagles continue to roll that year. Uh, you win the regular season, and you go into the MEAC tournament as overwhelming favorites. What do you tell the team as you got ready for, as you always talk about, those five days in March? One game at a time. Um, let's make sure we prepare. Let's make sure we stay together. Uh, let's make sure we overcome adversity, and let's make sure we get to the next play. Regardless of what happened, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, let's make sure we get to the next play. We had an intense focus, man. I remember, I think we came out that first night. I think we beat Howard by close to 50 points. And I... Each time they called the timeout, the guys in our huddle was pretty much saying, um, you know, let's take this to another level. And I think that actually began um, earlier in that regular season where we played a and here. And um, they had beat us in the MEAC tournament. And our guys, it didn't sit well with our guys. I remember us being up. 28 points and Pooby Chapman coming back to the bench saying that ain't enough we gotta it gotta be 50 with them remember what they did last year like it's 50 so we're up 40 something points with three minutes left and our guys are like look they better not score you know they, they wanted to send a message and that was the maturation process of uh, that basketball team and it just really carried over into the media tournament <laughs> for your leadership and the kind of heart you have and the way you have this team focused on integrity and truth and service. What you do on that court is extraordinary. You represent North Carolina Central University in a way that only others can imagine. And all I have to say is thank you. Thank you. So you win the tournament championship that year against Morgan State, um, the first one here at North Carolina Central, and you get your first NCAA tournament appearance. Um, how did it feel, uh, as, you know, coming here as a coach to be able to get that first Division One championship? Man, it was it's really indescribable just being able to do that, and I think our fifth year of existence, or whenever it was, it was, man, it was monumental, man. Like it was. You know, it's really tough to put into words. Even years after the fact, it's, even to this day, it's really difficult to put into words. Those kids were really, really special. And I knew they were special at the time, but I didn't know how special they really were until years later. And I don't know if I, I hope and I wish and I pray, but I don't know if I can never get another team to um, click on all cylinders and be connected at the hip and, and love each other the way those guys loved each other. And that's my goal. That's my desire as a coach. But, you know, they were truly special. They were truly remarkable. And not only overcoming adversity, but, 
you know, just reaching new heights and, you know, raising the bar for this basketball program. NCCU made its first Division I tournament appearance in San Antonio against Iowa State. Harima Javara was able to give the Eagles a lead in the first half after a three-pointer, but the third-seeded Cyclones proved to be a tough test and defeated the Eagles 93-75 in their first trip to the Big Dance. Following the 2013-14 season, two of the Eagles' backcourt anchors graduated after their senior years. NCCU's all-time assist leader Emmanuel Chapman and the 2013-14 MEAC Player of the Year Jeremy Ingram. NCCU retained frontcourt players Caramo Javara and Jordan Parks, but stepping into the guard roles for the first time as Eagles were Nimrod Hilliard and Anthony McDonald. After two consecutive seasons of going 15-1 in conference play, the Eagles raised the bar by going 16-0, making that squad the first team in school history to go undefeated in league play in men's basketball. They were really special in their own right, man, because they just kind of refused to lose. Uh, it was the leadership of uh, KJ and Jordan Parks. They just led those guys, unlike any other. And I remember, early, it's always that defining moment in the year where you say, okay, this is going to be really, really good or really, really bad. And we had lost to Memphis, and we didn't play well, and I mean, it was just an awful game for us. And we had a team meeting the moment we got back, and I'm the guy who was raised to say how you feel, get it out the way, and then move forward instead of bottling your emotions and keeping everything in. So we had a team meet in the moment we arrived back. And I allowed each player to go in front of his team and sit in front of his team and address each teammate um, openly and honestly and as candid as he possibly could. And when it got to KJ, I'll never forget, he, he went in on his teammates. And... It wasn't a disrespectful going in on him. It was, you hurry, better hurry up and get your act together, man, because this is my senior year and I ain't going out like that because of you. And if you want to fight, we'll fight. If you got something to say, we'll handle However we're going to do it, we're going to handle it right now. But tomorrow, you're going to be a better man and a better teammate. And, man, it was like Ray Lewis. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he just raised the level. Um, of, of competitiveness of, of each individual. And I'm super proud of that young man because again, I was, my leaders were Pooby Chapman the year before and then KJ and now you realize you, th those guys don't come along every day. So coach, during that run, of course, all the consecutive MEAC wins and you have the second longest home court winning streak in the nation. How did it feel when you, over those three years, you had those guys go out there and you just had a feeling that, you know, we're going to win this game at home? Yeah, everything was electric then, man. I, I think, you know, those guys were so well-liked amongst, you know, their peers and contemporaries across the campus that the student support was, you know, beyond imaginable because they liked those guys. Um, they were just great guys on campus. I think over a three-year span, we were 48-2 and two at one time. And I think the two losses were by like one point apiece. So there was a, a scenario where we could have very well been 48 and 0. And when you do that, it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with me. It's just great basketball players, man. Like those guys just refused to lose and they got at it so hard in practice that game time, they really made it easier and they bought into everything that, um, you know, I was trying to present to them. And they had a taste of the NCAA tournament and they wanted to go back. You know, once you <laughs> once you taste a piece of cake, like it's like, okay, this is this sugar high. I I, I need to go get that back. Um, and so everything that they did on a day-to-day -day basis was just to chase that sugar high again. believe that and come out and play to the best of our abilities and everything else will work itself out. Let's go, have fun, y'all. Let's go have fun, y'all. Young boys on three. One, two, three. Young boys. Hey, go back.
I've accomplished. I never look at the numbers. I really don't read articles, but when people throw little nuggets at me, 30, the number one in the nation in conference wins. You know, that's, think about that for a second. What these kids have accomplished have been tremendous. 35 conference wins. They have the number two winning home streak in the nation. 2015 MEAC tournament, first round blowout Coppin State, and you run into the Delaware State team again that you played very close on national television, and they get the better of you in the conference tournament. Um, how did you talk to the team after that game and prepare them for their first NIT appearance? You know, it was disappointing to say the least. It was so, so much pressure um, on us to win because we had completed the season 16-0 um, and 0 in regular season. And I think over time we had won 20, 20 consecutive games and uh, we had really beat Coppin really good in the, the night before. And then the Delaware State game, we got in foul trouble. And I didn't, it's one of the games I regret as a coach. I didn't do my best. Those kids did everything they supposed to do. I, I just didn't, my substitution and my rotations were, weren't good. And uh, I told them that after the game, and I take the blame of that. We didn't play our best basketball, but I didn't do my best as a coach to help them. So it really wasn't their fault. And God rest her soul, I remember Deborah Saunders, white chancellor. She met me in the, um, the tunnel as we were walking. And she said, y'all have nothing to be ashamed of. Get those guys' heads up and let's go to the NIT and um, you know, walk out of here with pride. And that oftentimes in those moments is, is nothing anyone can say um, to appeal and, and lift your spirits. But what she said at that particular moment really lifted our spirits. And um, you know, we realized we came up short and uh, it was going to have to go back to the drawing board, but we were still awarded the opportunity to go to the NIT. In the Eagles' second consecutive postseason appearance at the Division I level, once again they gave their opponent all they could handle at Miami. Jordan Parks powered the Eagles with a game-high 25 points with seven rebounds, and the Eagles were able to draw within two with under a minute to go after a clutch layup by Karamo Javara. But the Hurricanes were able to weather the storm and come away with a 75-71 win in the opening round of the NIT. You started your career at Coppin State, and you were an all MEAC um, rookie player at Coppin State. So you were familiar with North Carolina Central. What did you know about the program uh, while you were at Coppin and before you came here? Yeah, funny story. Uh, I actually met Lavelle my prep year. Um, we He was up in North New Jersey uh, to recruit a kid by the name of Ramon Johnson, um, a good long uh, friend of mine, um, longtime friend of mine. And uh, he was up to recruit him. He was a big kid. Uh, so I, I kind of, you know, met him because my prep school coach was kind of trying to shop me to Lavelle as well. Um, and his his main thing was just that they were kind of set on, pretty much set on guards. They just were looking for a big. So at that time, you know, I got introduced to him um, and, you know, looked into the school a little bit. So I kind of knew before going to Coppin State, you know, a little bit about Central. But uh, that's that's pretty much how that, you know, whole thing about me learning about Central came about. You come here, 2015-16, you start playing, and things don't go as planned. Um, what was that season like in your eyes? It's tough because it was kind of like a fill-out year, trying to me get adjusted to his program and his ways and his system and how things are done. He wants things done to a down to a science. I mean, he wants it done the right way because he feels like, you know, if you give good energy, good things happen. Bad energy, bad things happen. So he wants everything to be done the right way because he feel like the right way always get rewarded. And, you know, I really wasn't used to doing things always the right way. Sometimes I have bad practice habits, you know, not showing up 30 minutes early to get stretched, get ready to go to work, you know, strolling in five minutes maybe before practice going through the motions in practice because I don't want to hurt myself for the game, not really giving much effort in practice, just playing games. Those were the things that I did, you know, before coming here and, you know, before getting used to Lavelle, you know, and having a senior campaign that, you know, I had. You mentioned good things happening. There's a couple of defining moments that I can pick out from your career. One of them during that junior year at Savannah State, you had a 30-point game. What do you remember about that? Oh, man, that's that's when, uh, when we were at Savannah – I had just talked to Lavelle about playing the one. <laughs> he had moved me from the wing to playing the one position. 
And uh, I mean, it's, it, playing the one wasn't really much. It wasn't nothing new to me. Um, you know, I've been playing one, two, three my whole high school career, eighth grade, because I've always been tall, but I can handle the basketball. So that wasn't nothing new to me. What was new to me was learning, again, his system from a different position. Um, I knew all the plays. I knew exactly what he wanted, but just learning, you know, the timing and, you know, how he wanted things done and how he wanted his plays ran, that was something new to me. So, but before the Savannah game, we talked kind of about it. You know, he was like, how you feel about playing the one? And I was like, like, wherever you need me, I'll play. I, you, you, he, I was like, I told him, like, you know how I am. Two consecutive postseason appearances for North Carolina Central. 2015 se- 16 season rolls along, and it doesn't go quite as planned. What made that season so difficult in your eyes? It was me. Um, I didn't do a good job of managing the roster. Um, I didn't do a good job of evaluating the character. Um, of the recruits that we bought in. They were talented enough, but it that season let me know that I'm not that good of a coach to coach character that's not there or instill some character that's not there. Um, so it made me realize that you can just get a, a average basketball player with great character before you take a great basketball player with low character. That whole season was my fault. I put that team together. Um, I didn't do a good job managing the roster. Uh, I lost a couple of coaches during the transition. And that's always difficult. You know, when you win, that's going to happen. They're going to, you know, peel from the the fruits of that tree and, and, and take some of those branches off. And I was left here, you know, kind of solo to finish the recruiting and finalize it. And I didn't get to know the recruits um, as best I possibly could have. So the following year, you know, I thought that's what happened. And I just thought um, there's no one to blame for that but me. After North Carolina Central University went undefeated in conference play for the first time in school history in the 2014-15 season, the Eagles went into the 2015-16 season riding high. Inside McDougald McLennan Arena, the Eagles had the second longest home court winning streak in NCAA Division I as they won 28 consecutive games at home. But that streak was snapped on a last second buzzer beater and that proved to be the first plot twist for the Eagles. NCCU went 7-9 in MEAC play that season and was eliminated in the quarterfinal round of the conference tournament. And with that, the Eagles were left to rebuild. So you go into 16-17 and you always talk about in all the press conferences about, you know, the expectations of the program and how, you know, everybody expects to win. So rolling into 1617, how did you manage those for yourself and also relay to the team, you know, last year was last year and what we can do going forward? We learn from our mistakes. Um, I learned from my, my mistake and I just wanted them to go ahead and learn from their mistake. Um, You know, every man must look himself in that mirror, um, whether he like it or not, and hold himself accountable. My mindset going into my senior year really was there's no, there's nothing after this. Like, this is it. So imagine you going into a whole new season, whole new year, knowing that after this, nothing. There's nothing else. You know, like, don't try to plan to play pro. Don't think like, well, what's after this? Just think that you have one season and just after this season, let's just say you die. That's how my mentality was. It was like all or nothing. Like there's no, you lose your, this this year is like, you, your college career was, basically was a loser. You know what I mean? And no one, I don't think in their right mind wants to be a loser. It just doesn't have a nice ring to it. You're a loser, you're a loser. Being a winner, is what people strive for. And I believe I set the tone going into my senior year with that mindset in the summer. Um, I lost over 20 pounds my my, uh, junior going into my senior year summer. Um, I got faster, stronger, um, stayed in the gym. You know, everything I just tried to sharpen because I knew going into my senior year, it was either MEAC championship or bust. Starting from the beginning is never easy. And it was more difficult for some than others. Every championship year, you always have these stories. And what many people don't know, <clears throat> and we laugh about it to this day, DeJuan Graff actually quit 
during preseason of that year. We have a mile run, and he had never really made his time. The year before, he was injured, and he didn't run it. To be honest with you, I don't know if he was really injured. That wasn't for me to question. But I just know, like, during preseason conditioning, when these miles present themselves to you, all of a sudden mysterious injuries happen, <laughs> right? So I'm not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV. But I always question that about him. And I always thought the people that can make that run always have a mental toughness on the basketball court when you really need them. And he didn't make his, his mild time. And we told him before uh, he returned from the summer, look, man, you better make your mild time, better make your mild time. And he said, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. It's only four laps. And he didn't make it. And you are going to run that mile until you make it. You're not going to touch my basketball floor. And I thought he got frustrated. He just said, well, I quit. I'm going home. So I called his mom and I told his mom and his aunt, come get him. Um, you know, this is the problem. We're going to get rid of the problem. He's bound to repeat the same things uh, that he did the following year. And all, again, his talent level was always there. I thought he was a great basketball player. And, uh, you know, he kind of broke down in my office and, you know, made me realize that I needed to be a little closer to him because he needed a male figure in his life. And I said, I'm going to do that. Um, and I'll make you that promise to do that and be closer to you. However, you still going to go make that mile time. And he went out there and his teammates went out there and he made his mile time. And I just, it was like Rocky and Apollo Creed running in the sand, you know, doing the, the Rocky movies, like when he made it, every, it was so refreshing. And I just saw his level of confidence go to a new height. And the problem with Dewan, he had never pushed himself. So he didn't know how great he could possibly be. And he was the key. And once he pushed himself and he became great, our team became greater. The rebuild started slowly. First, a historic game from Pat Cole. And you had a triple-double game against Jackson State. Uh, what do you remember about that triple-double, becoming the first ever player to do that in the Division One era here? It felt amazing. Uh, I, I kind of remember a little bit what I was telling you. It was just like I didn't even know. Um, I was just out there playing like I do any other game. You know, I really don't get caught up in stats. You know, like stats have always been exactly what they are. They're just statistics for other people to judge you off. You know, what really matters to me is either we won or we didn't. You know what I mean? And things I could have did differently. Not that if I had one more assist, we would have won. Like you can't calculate that. But what you can do is calculate the times that you missed a def defensive assignment or the times that, you know, a, another pass could have been made or this or that. But getting caught up in statistics wasn't really my thing. But to find out that I did that was a great feat, man. It was like, it was it was something that, you know, I, I really never really dreamed of. But when I heard you say it, it was like, wow. And it just sent like chills through my body. Like, hey, that's crazy to be the first one ever. It's pretty, pretty tough. Do you remember that performance? And what do you remember about what he did in that game? I do. I think the, uh, I think I remember you calling it actually, and I think the the assist that gave him a triple double was a dunk to wheel, if I'm not mistaken. And I don't remember a lot about a lot of games, but I remember that. But Pat always had the ability, man. It was never his ability. Um, it was always, you know, his mental approach and, you know, his uh, motivation to go out and be the best. And I had to give him that a little more than I would like to, but uh, at the end of the day, he, he, he really grasped what I was trying to tell him. And oftentimes these kids don't get it to their senior year. I don't know why that is. I wish they got it a little earlier, but they get it their senior year. They see a light at the end of the tunnel, and then you know, they, their ability um, coupled with their mental approach ascends them to another level. Then a win over perennial Horizon League favorite Northern Kentucky and then a wire-to-wire -wire win over Missouri, the Eagles' first victory against an SEC opponent. And just hearing you talk about the camaraderie of that team and how they work so well together, it really showed themselves early in that season. You get off to a hot start, and then you go off to Columbia and beat Missouri in their building. Um, what made that team so good early in the season? We got rid of some guys. Um that didn't buy in, that was probably affecting the, the person beside them. Um, and the Missouri victory, it was really special because the two nights before we played Northern Kentucky and right before we got on the bus for a uh, shoot around, 
I remember getting a call from Ingrid saying that uh, Chancellor Saunders White had passed. And her and I were really close and I had to, obviously I was emotional, but I had to get myself together because we had a game to play. And she always, to honor her, she always said, um, I can handle it, coach. I can handle it. I can, shoot, I'm a big girl. I can put my big girl pants on. So I, I just always heard her voice. And I just said to myself, if she was here right now, she would tell me, coach, you got to put your big boy pants on and just go out there and coach the game. And uh, we ended up defeating Northern Kentucky. And two nights later, we went to Missouri and <clears throat> we defeated Missouri. And I knew it was her. I like, I felt her spirit. I felt her spirit in my ear the entire time. And it was one of those games that you really couldn't explain. Uh, our guys played extremely well, and we expected to win the game when we walked off the walked on the floor and when we walked off the floor. If you look at the, the video, when we walked off the floor, there was no deep celebration. It wasn't a deep celebration in the locker room. It was like, okay, we came, we saw, we conquered. This is what we we prepare for, and this is what we expected to do. And um, you know, right there, when you defeat a Power Five school, you know something can possibly be in the making. After going 9-5 and in non-conference play, the Eagles faltered in their first MEAC game. But after a disappointing loss at home, NCCU strung together 13 consecutive league wins to claim their third regular season MEAC title. But even with the highs, there were lows at the end of the season as well. But I mean, since you brought up the travel, non-conference, and then even conference games, what's it like, you know, going through that haul um, as a player? Um, non-conference, the con Coach Moten breaks it down in three seasons. You have your non-conference, your conference, and then the conference tournament. So he, what he did was we can't think about nothing else right now. We're in non-conference. This is all we're thinking about is, you know, our next opponent or who we, you know, play next and who we play now. And um, he's always broken down to us like that. And I think my senior year, we went 12 and 5 non-conference. If I'm not mistaken, it, it might be something around like 9 and 5 or something like that. And, uh, we just did that, exactly what he said. You know, I think my senior year, the difference between the years is we did a lot of listening to what he was telling us. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't, nah, we don't want to, like, like, let's go do it this, like, no. Like, he said something that was like, all right, let's, let's see if, let's, let's try that. Like, let's, that, let, that, let that be the first option, you know, what he says. And every time we let it be our first option, we, we were successful, you know. So we kind of started buying into that, and then it was like, so non-conference, what is he telling us to do? Focus on the next game. What did we do? Focus on the next game. And we came out victorious on a lot of them or even was in a lot of games, you know, fighting with a lot of the big schools that we weren't expected to, you know, be in games with. That season continues on. You get those wins in non-conference. You get into conference play. You go 13-3. and three. You do cool off just a little bit at the tail end. Um, what do you tell the team to refocus them and get them ready for the conference tournament? The cooling off part was my fault again. Uh, <laughs> I was, I remember it like yesterday. We had clinched early and uh, against Bethune Cookman, and we think we had like two or three games remaining. And one of the things that happened to us years ago in the MEAC tournament was uh, Jeremy Ingram sprained his ankle. Um, in the last regular season game. So when we got to the tournament, he was unable to play. Like, he could barely walk up and down the floor. And I vowed to myself, if I could ever manage that situation differently, I will not put those kids or, you know, your best player in that position again. So with us clinching, like, with three games to go, I said, I'd be a fool to continue to play. And now all of a sudden get a, somebody gets an a ankle or a knee or something, and now we or a concussion, now we're going to the MEAC without our best player because people only care about those four or five days in March. So I told the team, the next game was Savannah, I told them I'm not gonna play you. And I told them that the day before. And then the day of, I was like, my competitive instincts just kicked in. I said, no, nah, y'all playing. So it kind of messed them up mentally. And then the, we, we didn't play well and we lost to Savannah. The following day, I did the, the next game, I did the same thing against a &T. Then I said, no, nah, it's a rival, we gotta play. And so I messed up their mentality instead of keeping them right there. But I think A&T beat us, and it was the best thing that ever happened to us, right? Because it got our attention. It made us hungry again. We were no longer celebrating and cutting down nets, and we realized, okay, the same thing that makes you laugh will also make you cry. So that was the best thing that happened to us because I got their attention. And the next day at practice, you know, we started off from day one. We, we went back to the square root 
and um, of what we do. And uh, they really responded. And in the MEAC tournament, you know, we just kind of blew everyone away, man, because of, again, we were disappointed with how the regular season ended, but our attention was um, made aware because of those losses. NCCU rolled to Scope Arena as the top seed for the first time since 2015. And the Eagles played just like that 2015 team as they opened with a convincing 95-60 win over Bethune-Cookman in the quarterfinal round. The Eagles moved past Maryland Eastern Shore in the semifinal and then faced a Norfolk State squad that eliminated NCCU in the previous year. The Eagles put on a defensive masterclass in the championship game as they held the Spartans scoreless for 11 consecutive minutes in the second half and claimed its second MEAC tournament championship by a score of 67 to 59. It, man, it's nothing I've ever been a part of. Like that, that run in a tournament, one and done games, and we just like beating teams by 40. Like it's, I, it's nothing I've, like I could have, you, I couldn't dream of it to be something like that. Like, you know, I'm thinking two, three point game, four point, five point games, championship game, close, one possession game. I'm not thinking we're just beating everybody by over 15 points. So it was like the focus, the coaches told me that like that was the most locked in they've seen me, you know, being up 7.30, getting guys to breakfast, um, making sure everyone's eating, making sure we're on the bus, ready to go, ready to roll, making sure guys are locked in, not playing on the bus, making sure, you know, we're getting to everything we had, anything we had to do, just making sure we're doing it in a timely fashion and a business-like approach. And it carried over into the game. For the first time in program history, the Eagles went to Dayton, Ohio to participate in the first four of the NCAA tournament. NCCU carried a lot of momentum into the game, and it showed in the first half. Senior guard Dewan Graff hit a three-pointer as time ran down to give the Eagles a 34-31 lead after the first 20 minutes, but UC Davis flipped the advantage into their favor in the second half after a big run right after the break. The Eagles refused to give in and timely threes from Graff and Rashawn Madison pulled them within two within the final minutes. However, NCCU couldn't find a way to regain the lead and fell by a narrow margin, 67 to 63. You're named most outstanding player of the tournament and MEAC player of the year that year as well. What did those honors mean to you? It meant a lot, man. Um, it, just, it just meant a lot coming from, you know, where I come from, Newark, New Jersey. Is, is big, not even just for me, but for that city, because, you know, a lot of people think, when you think about Newark, you think of bad things, gang violence, um, you know, all kinds of violence. You, you don't think about good things just always coming out of that city. And just for something like this to happen for me, um, it was just big for, for me and the city and for the, you know, for my family as well. Like my mom, um, dad passed away uh, about seven, seven, eight years ago. So it was kind of big for, you know, just the 
the name on the uh, back of my jersey and for my city. And for you, is not the fact that you joined the team as a walk-on. You joined a championship team as a walk-on. What was it like um, experiencing that in your first season? I remember that first season when we were led by so many seniors who were key contributors to the team. And for me to be in my first year, I just wanted to help them reach their goal. And I didn't know what that was going to take. And for me, it's hard to put into words what it meant to win that first championship because it's like, wow, this feeling that you get when you win is worth it. It's worth all the hard practices, all the fighting in-house, after games, before games, the uncertainty of it all is worth it. And that's what that first year taught me. Uh, and you just want to hold that standard every year after. You transferred here from Kent State University. What did you know about North Carolina Central University before you came here? Um, I just knew that it was a, running, a winning program. Um, I did my research. Uh, I found out Coach Moten was a, um, an excellent coach. So that played a big part of me coming here. And then, you know, I liked the atmosphere when I came here. It seemed like it was all about basketball. You know, when I came here, the coaches, they greeted me well. They invited me in. So... You know, I just felt like it was a home environment. And, of course, one of the things with college athletics is seniors, they do graduate. So they left the program, and the next year you came back with the experience. Um, what were you able to learn from them to help with a team that brought in some new freshmen? What I learned from them that it, is that if you trust Coach Moden and you really buy into his system, um, whether that's early on in the season or late on in the season, you're going to win games. And when that team, that senior team, really bought into what Coach Moten was preaching every single day, they achieved so much more. So that next year, I knew going into the offseason, we have the blueprint for success. Now it's just a matter of following it and getting these new guys to understand that wherever you're coming from, now you're on NC Central, and this is how we do things. And that's what's going to lead to our success. So you transferred here. Your first experience must have been a whirlwind for you. So much travel. Um, tough starts to the year. What was it like making that transition process? Uh, it was tough because, you know, like at Kent, I didn't really play. So, you know, coming here and then playing all of those minutes and, you know, just being such a such a big part of the team, such a key part of the team, it was tough. And, you know, coming in, I didn't understand, like, the responsibilities that come with, like, being, like, the so-called, like, the best player or, like, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, you know, it's, it's like responsibilities and it's, it's rules and things that come with being there. So, you know, I wasn't aware of that. And, you know, coming into my senior, senior year, I had to learn of those, like, responsibilities and start to carry myself in a manner like such as I am. Your first year here playing inside, you had Pablo Rivas next to you. How much did he help you out um, being as somebody who had played here before as a forward? Um, Pablo was a, he was a big help, you know, he was someone, like he said, who played here the, the year previous before me, my red show year. Um, he was a knockdown shooter, you know, he could, he could score the ball, athletic, you know, like he just did everything. He made it easier, he made it easier for me, like he did all the things that I really didn't do too well that year. So, you know, he was, he played a big part in us winning that championship. So 2017-2018 season doesn't quite go the same way as that 2016-17 when you went 13-3 and and were regular season champions. Um, what was it like going through that season, um, especially because, you know, you came in, you had that success, and it just didn't go the same way? You know, one of the quotes we always talk about is how adversity introduces a man to himself. And that season, there's a ton of adversity, whether it was uh, starting lineup changes, uh, things that were just new to that year that wasn't a, really a problem in the previous year. And we went through that, but to me, going through that struggle, going through that fire day in, day out, maybe not getting the wins that we thought we would early on, I think it prepared us for what happened later on this season. So you get another MEAC championship, and you roll into 2017-18, and once again you have senior turnover. And you go into the 2017 year with two freshmen in your backcourt with uh, Jordan Perkins and Reggie Gardner Jr., and that season had its ups and downs, and you end up going to the tournament as a sixth seed. Um, what was it like going through that year, especially once again with the pressure and expectations on your back? Well, that was the one year we said, okay, we're going to commit to rebuilding. And honestly, we didn't expect neither of those freshmen to play right away. To be honest with you, we really expected to redshirt both of those kids. But, you know, the one thing about us around here, we're fair. Whoever's playing the best, that's who's going to play. We don't promise anyone anything. I don't care if you're on scholarship in-state. I don't care if you're on scholarship out of state. I don't care if you're a walk-on. Whoever's playing the best and busting their butt every single day at practice, earning those minutes, will play. And 
Um, those freshmen earned those minutes, and a lot of times those upperclassmen didn't respect what we had going on, so I sat them down. And it was growing pains with them, and I knew it was going to be growing pains, but I always felt like once we reached the MEAC tournament, if we can win our first game with this group and give them some, some confidence, as a coaching staff, we'll figure it out and we'll instill um, a great game plan for them to be successful in the next game. And I said, if we could just get the first game under wraps and get those guys to believe, I said, anything can happen, and it did. Inside for the Eagles, you had leadership from Pablo Rivas and Rashawn Davis. And then you mentioned um, whoever it is, next man up, going into the starting five at the late end of the year and starting all through the tournament was John Guerra. Um, what did he, as well as Pablo Rivas, being an upperclassman, what did they bring to the team as far as leadership? Well, John was more so the leader. John just, you know, it's, it's been – implemented in him, I guess. Um, it, it's been ingrained with him. I know he has some, a year at the Navy. Um, his parents are incredible um, human beings um, who brought him up the right way. And as a result, it, it just really helped. And, and he's held every single one of his teammates accountable uh, more times than not. And even though he was a walk-on, I think he always respected the fact that, you know, this man is going to play me if I play hard and, and, and do what he asks. And uh, he did that early in the year. And then he did it a little more. Then he did it a little more. And before you know it, uh, I said, yo, let's just start, John. <laughs> like, why? why not? And this guy hit some huge shots down the stretch of the regular season for us, provided some great defense, provided a spark for us. Any loose ball on the floor he was going to get, he became a fan favorite. He really energized the crowd, energized our bench, energized our team. And it carried over um, into the, the MEAC tournament where he was big for us on more than one occasion. So um, without John in that championship game against Hampton, we don't win it. After two consecutive MEAC tournament wins, the Eagles again found themselves in unfamiliar territory as they went 9-7 and seven in league play and went to Norfolk as the number six seed. In that tournament against Coppin State, the first game, uh, which ended up going in as the lowest scoring first half in MEAC tournament history. <laughs> what was the score? I mean, it was it was 18 to 17 Coppin State at part. halftime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, how did you get that team to, to fight through? It was late. Reggie Gardner Jr. made a three that really turned the tide. But how did you really get that team to get through that first game before going forward? It was going to be that type of game with that team. We just struggled to score. Like we, it wasn't, we were shooting bad. No, we just struggled to score. We really weren't as talented offensively as the teams in the past. You know, I could just throw the ball out there and they go get a bucket. We had guys that could just say, coach, just everybody get out the way. I got this. That team didn't have that. And that's what made it even more challenging to coach. And, you know, some of the guys we thought would provide that for us, you know, for whatever reason, it just, it just didn't happen. Um, so for us to be, down one during the MEAC tournament, I, I would like to say we had them right where we wanted them, you know what I'm saying, because we we just didn't have a lot of talent at that time. But And Coppin was great defensively, and, and, you know, once you play another team in the tournament, the scores tend to decrease a little. Um, the margin of error decreases a little. And you just know, like, one possession, it's going to boil down to one possession. And uh, regardless of the score, it's going to boil down to one possession. And you got to be mentally tough enough to get to that possession and fight until things go your way. And I think that's what we did. To be honest, looking back on it, that's one of my proudest moments is winning that game. Because, yes, it was an ugly game. It was, it was probably really disgusting to watch, to be honest, if you weren't, if you weren't in it. But when you were in it, it was, it was my type of game. To me, it was an NC Central type of game. It was all about toughness winning each possession late in the game to separate because that separation wasn't going to come from pretty basketball. It wasn't going to come from hitting nice threes or, you know, beautiful layups or any of that. It was just dog, it was a dog fight. It was a, it was a, a fight with a basketball, and that's what Coach Moore always talks about, a street fight with a basketball. That's what that game versus Coppin State was, and it just gave me a lot of confidence to know that we could win a close game and that this tournament, it wasn't going to go the same way the regular season did, that's for sure. That game was tough, and then it's Savannah State in the quarterfinal. 
um, a team that was known to put up a bunch of points, and you went up and down the floor with them at their place. Um, Rashawn Davis ends up turning his ankle at some point during that game, and he comes back and still puts up 20 rebounds in that game. Um, what do you remember about that Savannah State win? The time that we played them in the regular season, I, I nudged one of my coaches and I said, we're not going to win this game, although we could. And I saw the way they played us. They played a funky, funky style, like it was unorthodox. But I said, we can win this game tonight. I said, but we're going to see this team again. So I don't want to adjust now. I would rather adjust in the MEAC tournament. And I told our guys at halftime, I said, listen, man, just continue to execute the game plan that we presented you right now. And after the game, I told them, we're going to see them again. We're going to make our necessary adjustments, and we're going to beat this team again. And we were interested in playing them. I, got, I was really looking forward to it, um, you know, in the MEAC tournament. And um, I, I knew everything was going to come down to one possession, but I knew – if you don't allow them to go up and down this floor, um, I didn't think they could beat you because I didn't think they shot the ball great. I think they just shot it a lot. So if you minimized um, the volume of shots that they had and put game pressure on them, it would be a different type shot when, when they had to take it. And that's what happened. I thought they tightened up a little bit down the stretch. Our guys uh, stepped up and made some plays. and. Um, you know, Raekwon Harney and C.J. Wiggins were, was huge for us, uh, you know, that game. And I remember them missing a three-point shot that really was very similar to the three-pointer that Norfolk missed. I had the same angle, you know, and I, I knew it was off when they shot it. And um, when I saw that, I was just happy that we advanced. You know, I'm blessed, and, you know, I like to give thanks to God. You know, I thank God all the time for, like, you know, everything that he's giving me, my abilities and everything like that. So, I mean, when I'm out there, I'm just playing. So... You know, after the game, I'm not really, you know what I'm saying, concerned with, you know, what I did individually. So, you know, I never really look at what I do like other people do. Like, you know, like sometimes it'll like people will hit me and be like, you know, like it's crazy like what you be doing. But it'd be like with me, it's just like, you know, me. So I, I can't really see like what other people be seeing. So it's kind of weird. It took two gritty wins to get the Eagles into the semifinals. And after defeating Morgan State 79 to 70, NCCU prepared to face Hampton, a team that defeated the Eagles 86-70 earlier in the year inside McDougald McClendon Arena. And the matchup didn't only happen with a championship on the line. It was also more or less a home game for the Pirates, whose campus is right across the Chesapeake Bay from Norfolk. The championship game was um, versus Hampton that year was unbelievable because if you remember early on in the season, they came into our place uh, on the nationally televised game and they they beat us pretty bad. And I remember after that game, you know, Coach Morton sort of challenged us, can we beat a team that has guards like that? And when we matched up with him again in the championship, I wanted to prove to him that, you know, we got guards too and we can win this game. So to go out there as, you know, pretty heavy underdogs and to beat a team as talented as that Hampton team was, which is a culmination of all the work we put in throughout the season. It was all worth it again, the adversity, the amount of losses we had to take on early in the season, some tough road trips, even that initial loss to Hampton in the regular season. It made us prepared for that ultimate fight in those bright lights when things aren't necessarily going to go the way you planned it, but you have to adapt and overcome, and that's what we did as a team. And It just meant, it meant the world to me to be able to help in, in some small way in that game. The two championships in North Carolina Central had won. They'd done as a one seed in the tournament. You get to the championship game as a number six seed and you win it. How special was that for you? Extremely special because, you know, that's when you really know you've done it against all odds, like all odds. No one in their right mind expected us, you know, to be in that situation. And I think everyone that chalked it up, if, especially if you followed us, you saw the good, the bad, and the uglies. And sometimes the bad and the uglies far outweighed the good. Um, so you just say, hey, they won it the last couple of years, so they okay right now. Just give them a chance to rebuild. But in our locker room, I was like, look, we're going to win this thing. All you have to do is just listen. And I told those kids that a thousand times. Let us put together a game, great game plan for you to come out here and just listen and you guys just execute it. And when things go around, 
we'll call time out and we'll do something else. But just promise me you'll stay locked in together, you'll stay mentally tough and you'll listen. And they did that and, you know, the rest is history. For the second year in a row, the Eagles went to Dayton, Ohio to participate in the first four, this time around against the SWAC champion, Texas Southern. Rashawn Davis collected a double-double of 19 points and 11 rebounds, and Pablo Rivas secured a game-high 12 rebounds with 7 points, but the Tigers got the better of the Eagles, 64-46. You go to the NCAA tournament your first time through and you get a double-double on the national stage against Texas Southern. Um, what was that experience like for you? Uh, it was crazy. Uh, it was like no other. The atmosphere any time in March Madness is just different. It's just a different atmosphere. Um, it's a different beast. And um, honestly, it was an amazing time even though we lost. Um, you know, I just I learned a lot that year. And then not not only but that year, but you know that last little home stretch and that 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 first four game last year, I learned a lot. And what what I took from that game, what I learned from that game, I tried to bring it to this year. With the 2017-18 season in the rearview mirror, the Eagles prepared for the 2018-19 season with a chance to make history. 2018-19, you roll in and ahead of this team, you put in front of them and said, "You have a chance to do something that's never been done before here, to win three straight championships," and you bring back a lot of the core from that championship. What was it like in your mind preparing for the 18-19 season? It didn't start off how I wanted it. I thought we came back um, fat and happy. I thought our NCAA game was in I thought we should build upon the NCAA game. I thought, you know, we didn't have half the talent that Texas Southern had and they, they beat our butts and let us know that. So I was hoping that our guys would go home and let that remain at the forefront of their workouts and, and understand why we're working out. But they went home and at the forefront of their minds was the MEAC championship. And I got it, I understood it because they, they went against all odds and they've overcome some adversity. But when they got back on campus, I didn't like the approach. I didn't like the mentality. I thought everyone was content with just winning last year. We had to shake things up once again. And again, it always goes back to whoever's doing what I asked them to do on a consistent basis, that's who's going to play. That's who's going to gobble the minutes. I don't care if you're a star, preseason player of the year, a former star, I don't care. You know, I care about the now. What are you doing right now? And um, we had to shake up some lineups and then we had to overcome some injuries. And, you know, we were able to do that. And even though I schedule was tough for the non-conference season. I thought we had some spurts where we really, really played well. And I said, man, if we can put this together over an extended period of time, i.e. 40 minutes, then I thought we could be really good. For you, personally, you were named a preseason first-team player. So what was it like going into that second year, now that you had that first year under your belt? Um, what did it feel like starting that next season? You know, like I come and, you know, I just try to be available for my teammates and be the best player that I can be. Like, I'm not really thinking about too much outside of, like, basketball. So, like, again, like accomplishments or, you know, like feats or, you know what I'm saying, me being named that or whatever, you know, I don't really think about that, you know, because I feel like, you know, you can't get too high or you can't get too low. So, and that's kind of how I keep myself in the middle. So, you know, I don't really pay attention to that like that. Your personal journey, you join as a walk-on, you have two championships, and not just that, you became a starter during that second year and then you come back for your senior year and now you're somebody that has to step in and be a leader for this team. What was it like transitioning fully into a role as a as an upperclassman, as somebody who started games and has that experience? Uh, what was your mindset over that summer before the next year started, before 18-19? Yeah, you know, it's sort of surreal for me because the journey happened so quickly and if you're looking from the outside, you might just think that bang, 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 it sort of happened like that, and now he's a starter, now he's a team captain. But really, there's a lot that goes into that. And in order to be successful, you have to prepare. So that summer, I knew I had to be ready to lead, and in order to do that, you have to be the one who goes first. You have to be the one who's put in the work so that you have the respect of the team, the same way I respected the Dewan Graffs of the world, Pat Cole, in my first year. So I really just focused in on how can I be at my best so that these guys can look up to me and get on with the program and we can take a step further and do what this school hasn't done before in winning three championships, which was the goal. The whole summer, all I thought about was how can we get this third one in a row? John is 
probably the hardest working person that I've probably met. His work ethic is just makes you like he's not the most talented out of the bunch. This is not the most skilled, but he will like literally die before somebody outworks him. And when you have a a guy around you like that, it's nothing but success waiting to happen for for you. Like it's like, and I realized that early that maybe my work ethic is not you know as high as his. So if I keep this guy around, what is that going to do to me? It's going to raise my work ethic. You know, looking at a guy like that and respecting something like that, you know, and just him being as a person, he's just a great person, you know, not even just talking basketball. Just me and John just had so many conversations about different things. I asked him a lot about his background and he's from Long Island. So it's like I'm from Newark and he's from Long Island. So it's like that up top connection. And it's just like that's just he he was probably for me personally um, and even the team success. He probably was the biggest piece my senior year, I can't even, you know, like make that up. Like he probably really was the biggest piece of our championship run. Overtime loss at Norfolk State. Um, what was it like experiencing that? And then as a senior, what did you tell those guys to help keep them pushing forward? I mean, the beauty about the MEAC is you have to be playing your best basketball in March. So whatever happens in January and February, you have to use – to learn and grow as a team and to improve upon your weaknesses. So my biggest thing was, how can I identify what our weaknesses are? Are we going hard enough in practice? Are we following scouting reports? That was a big thing I harped on. We need to just focus on what we can control, and that is locking into the opponent, uh, taking advantage of their weaknesses while focusing on our strengths. So that's sort of the leadership I could bring is, I've been there before, been through the adversity. The key is to not get too low, through that process, also not to get too high if we have a big win, because when it comes down to March, you still got to win in the scope. So just bringing that sort of perspective is what I tried to do throughout the season to help our team ultimately become victorious. NCCU played well in the regular season against MEAC opponents, and the Eagles went 10-6 and to finish with the number three seed. NCCU played its season finale on the road against North Carolina A&T, and with the Eagles on pace to finish third, it appeared the Eagles and Aggies were on pace to meet for a second time in seven days, this time in the semifinals of the MEAC tournament. The regular season has its ups and downs. You go to the tournament as the number three seed, and you know that you have a chance to face North Carolina A&T again as you, you fell to them both times in the regular season. Opening round game, you go out and you put your best performance in against Delaware State, and then it's North Carolina A&T for the third time that year. What would you tell the team in the locker room before that semifinal matchup? You know, it was very similar to the speech um, about Savannah years ago. We played A&T, we were playing them at their place to finish the regular season. And I told our staff, I said, they're really good, but I don't think they would do well against, if we did this, I don't think they'll respond well. I said, however, I already looked at the brackets. They'll probably finish second, we'll probably finish third, which means we'll play each other next week. So I'm not gonna show them that now. You know, I said, so again, we gotta go ahead and be vanilla and play our best. And I didn't like the last regular season game and they, they beat us, but we had like a 10 day break. Like I didn't even know how to manage that time. So, so I had to get the guys spirits and, and, and bodies readjusted to, um, you know, what was at hand. And so entering the tournament, when we played NT, I thought we did, a, we threw a lot of things at them that they hadn't seen before. And um, I don't think they adjusted well during that time, and I saw the confusion on their faces. Uh, to their credit, they fought hard, and they came back and, you know, bust, bust us in our mouth and made us taste our own blood a little bit. But our guys were resilient throughout, and uh, we finished the game and we closed it. Honestly, that was probably one of my most, like, favorite games of the year. That was probably my favorite game of the year because, like, um, they, had a, they had a guy. I don't, I'm not familiar with his name or anything like that, but he was a big, strong guy. And, like, you know, all they had him in there to do was to lean on me. And, you know, I felt like the first two games he kind of, you know, he kind of got over on me. So, you know, I, like, I kind of had took it personal, so I made it my business. Like, you know what I'm saying, we're not going to lose this game. So, you know, it was, it was like on that. But, I mean, you know, 
outside of that, though, you know, my teammates had my back, and they, they was looking for me that game, too. So I'm just thankful, you know, Jordan Perkins, you know, Reggie. Everybody that was out there, they was just feeding me the ball that game. So, you know, I had a pretty good game that game. But, yeah, I, I took it personal, though. I took that one personal. It's, once again, everything hangs on one game. What was your feeling uh, before that game started? Going into the game, you know, in that – in that tournament in Norfolk at the Scope Arena, I just feel like it brings out the best in our team. And I, and I think that's a, once again, that's a testament to Coach Moten and sort of how he prepares us throughout the whole season to always value the possession, that you can win or lose a basketball game in just one possession. So to be honest, I was extremely confident going into that game, even though, yes, once again, we're the underdog. They're uh, playing on essentially their home court, you know, in front of their fans. I still felt very confident because I just feel like our program wins in March. Our program has owned the Scope Arena the past three years. So for me, it was just natural to feel confident and to trust the process that, you know what, I don't know how this game is going to shake out, but I know we're going to come out on top. NCCU faced Norfolk State in the championship for the second time in three years. And just like the previous meetings with the Spartans, it was a thriller. NCCU trailed by 10 at the half, but immediately started the second period with a 12-0 run to pull in front. The Eagles outscored Norfolk State 28-15 in the second half, but NCCU had to hold its breath as the Spartans had a chance to send the game to overtime at the death. So going into the finals, I knew it was going to be an ugly game because the recovery time, I, I thought we got back to the hotel at 1 a.m. from the semifinals and had to wake up at 8, get, hit breakfast and do the scout report. So I was tired as a coach and I hadn't run up and down the floor. So I knew those guys' bodies were tired. So I just said, listen, man, it's, this game is always going to be about who wants it more. No one's going to shoot it great. No one's going to have a bunch of open looks. It's not going to be an um, a offensive clinic and a, a, a great offensive seminar. It's going to go boil down to old school uh, 1980s NBA physical basketball and whoever have the last shot and whoever have the last possession has to win that possession and we ended up winning it. That's the reason I came here. They, they told me to come here and win championship, and that's what I am. Read that right there. Hey, everybody that doubted us, we knew we was going to be right here. That's all we got. That's all we got. That's all we need right here. We're champions, baby. And, uh... <laughs> yeah. Tournament championship is held in Norfolk, Virginia. Twice you beat Norfolk State, one time you beat Hampton. How hard is it to win at Scope Arena going up against the hometown teams? I ain't never look at it like that till you said it. That, that's, they should give us a, a, another championship just for going through that. But, um, you know, it's always difficult. And, um, you know, we have this mantra now that the standard is the standard around here. And, you know, I said a while back um, that we were like the, the, the Duke of HBCUs. Like you go into an arena and people either love you or they hate you. And um, we've certainly embraced that role of being the villain. And that's what happens when you're not only on the road, but when you're on the road at the MEAC tournament when the stakes is high and uh, you're playing for all the marbles. Sometimes you have teams, and you can see it in the crowd, you have teams that's sticking around just to cheer against us. You know, so the arena's full, but they're really cheering against North Carolina Central. The only people that's cheering for North Carolina Central are North Carolina Central fans. But now you have, um, you know, fans of different teams staying there cheering against us. And at first I was like, what are y'all doing? But we, we've learned to accept that. We've come to embrace that. And 
that means you you really elevated the program and that that means you you're really about something and I'll take it and so to defeat the two quote unquote home teams um in the last 3 years you know it's a it's a it's a testament to the character of my basketball team how tough they are and how resilient they've been uh because things aren't going to go your way especially on the road in those hostile environments um on national television and somehow or another the last three years they found a way to to fight and fight themselves through and become champions. I remember after the game was over you said that you never would have to experience the feeling of losing in that building. What does it feel like to be able to finish up your career going 10 and 0 in the MEAC tournament? You know, it's it's really hard to explain to people um when you win like that that the feeling of losing is so much worse than how good it feels to win. You just don't want to have that feeling of losing, of going home when you know you could have made it to the tournament if you just won one or two more games. And to never have that feeling of losing in that building is, is really fortunate for me because one of the first things I always see every time, every past three years when we've won is the dejected look on the team who's lost and you just see them crushed. As much as you see our guys celebrate and you see the other team just completely crushed. And to avoid that and to have the feelings of getting, that, getting those wins in those key spots, you know, it's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Three consecutive MEAC tournament championships brought three consecutive trips to the first four in Dayton, Ohio. And it also brought with it a third different opponent as the Eagles faced North Dakota State. The Eagles shot 63% from the perimeter in the second half and held a slim lead with five minutes to go over the Bison. However, North Dakota State hit a few timely three-pointers of its own and left NCCU heartbroken in Dayton once again after a 78-74 final score. So you win the MEAC tournament, you're named Most Outstanding Player, and then you go to Dayton again, and you have a double-double in that game, 20-plus points. What was it like for you, even though, of course, it wasn't a win, but to be able to say that you gave everything you could in the final game that you played here at North Carolina Central? Um, I, it was an honor. You know, it's an honor and a, it's a pleasure to be to be a part of, like, such a legacy, such as um, NCCU. You know, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to play here. You know, um, NCCU has given me, like, an opportunity to set, like, the rest of my life up, you know what I'm saying, a positive light. So, you know, I'm forever grateful for that. Yeah, four NCAA tournament appearances. Um, of course, your first trip, um, much different than the other three. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit about that first experience and then how the other three have differed in their own right? The first one, I never enjoyed it. Um, you know, my son, I think we, we won it on Saturday. On Monday, my son was in the, a burn center. So that, that stunk, um, you know, personally. Um, I didn't have the opportunity to, to take my family with me. And, you know, I don't even remember nine, ten plays from the Iowa State game. I, I was so worried about getting back here. So I thought we were really good that year. And I thought we could go to the Sweet 16. And I was sitting in the house one night maybe two weeks prior, and I said, there's only two teams in the country that I probably wouldn't want to face because we don't match up well against. I said, anyone else, I think we defeat. And I said, those two teams, I was watching Iowa State play Kansas, and I said, the two teams that would probably give us fits simply because we didn't match up well was Iowa State and uh, Louisville. And so two weeks later at the selection show, they said, North Carolina Central, 14 seed, and then going to San Antonio, Texas, and they'll play – the Cyclones of Iowa State, I was like, good God Almighty, <laughs> right? Like the one team that I felt like, because I thought they were really good. And the reason we didn't match up well, because they were so old and they were so big at every position. Like their point guard was 6'6", and he was like 24, you know? So I just thought they presented us with a difficult matchup. So for the first time in NCAA history for our tournament appearance, I thought we fought. And I was extremely proud of our guys. And I think it was down four or five at the half. Uh, we didn't finish the half the way we were capable of, but um, they had so much fire, firepower on the court in the second half, I thought it just wore us down. And I was extremely proud of our guys. The previous years, you know, uh, it came down to one possession. Um, 
the the team with Pat Cole. Um, I just didn't. I thought we were tight. I thought we didn't make our layups. Like we missed open layups. The shots that we. I think we might have been four for twenty something from the three point line. And I just wanted our guys to relax. The year following that, um, we didn't have a chance. Um, you know, our guys was like deers in headlights. And Texas Southern had been there. I think they were like, look, man, we. Those kids at Texas Southern, they were, talent-wise, they were better. And I thought we could just learn something, and I thought we could just grind and, you know, try to figure it out. But uh, Trey Jefferson was in incredible that night, and, you know, it was difficult to stop him. And uh, and we shouldn't have been there in the big scheme of things. You know, it's like, okay, you, the C Cinderella done took the glass off a foot. Now y'all can sit down and, you know. And I thought our guys was just happy to be there instead of, going out there to keep the legacy going. Um, and then this year, you know, playing North Dakota State, I, again, man, there's no, I will never feel guilty and we want to win games just as bad as anyone once we get to that point, but I'm not going to feel guilty once we get to that point because there's no bad teams. It ain't no, you should win this. No one can ever say y'all should have won this game or, you know, like it's it's going to be, Man, it's, it's just going to be a, a matter of attrition throughout the game. And, um, you know, it, it's educated our guys. It's educated our fans because they know now, okay, for us to take this program and, and go to another level, here's what we're going to need. You know, we got to lift more because you can see a difference between their bodies and our bodies and, you know, those things. So it's been an educational process. And, it don't feel good. It's uncomfortable while you have to sit in it, but I'm going to trust it, and um, hopefully we'll learn from it and get our first tournament victory soon. And John, um, he becomes the first person here at North Carolina Central to be a part of three championship rosters. And for you to be a part of the first uh, championship, although you didn't get to play in the second and third, but to say that you had a part and helping to start something that never happened before here in North Carolina Central. How does that make you feel? Hey, man, it makes me feel great that the success of the program is continuing. Um, just being an alumni, I could go talk to any school, like, I mean, any anybody that went to another uh, college and just tell them, like, hey. And it's people that starting to really know who North Carolina Central is that didn't know before. Um, it's crazy because, like, I go talk to, oh, so you went to North Carolina Central. Oh, yeah, I saw you guys playing the first floor, this, that. Oh, I like you guys' school, your coach. is so swaggy and, you know, all types of things. And it's just like people are starting to really know who North Carolina Central is because I say that because my sophomore year when I transferred in, people were like, you're going where? And, it, like, to see the flip and to see how that changed now, it's just amazing. And I love it. And I just hope he wins four, five, six. So it just – the. The school grows and the, everyone know everyone knowing about the school grows. I just hope that continues. And this is something I don't know if you know this or if, if you've thought about it at all, but you're the only person that's been on all three of those championship rosters. What does that mean to you when you think about that? I mean, to me, it's a lot to do with the right timing. You know, I, I would be... I'd be ill-advised to say that, you know, we won those three championships because of any individual, whether that was Coach Moen, whether that was any of the players. It's just extremely fortunate, and I'll never forget for the rest of my life that I had the opportunity to be that, that guy who has been on these three teams because all three teams had different identities, and all three teams had different struggles, different victories, different triumphs, and to be sort of just someone who can be a constant is it's an honor and it's it's an honor you wanted to pay back to the guys who came before you you know the biggest thing for me was I don't want those guys who come to the game you know those the CJ Wilkerson's of the world the Jeremy Ingram's the Pooby Chapman's the guys who have left a legacy you don't want those guys to come to your games and say you know what they dropped off that's the biggest thing and that really scared me you know that really scared me that we may not live up to what they left because they left behind an incredible legacy. So for me to be able to honor that legacy and to sort of hopefully create one of my own has been a complete dream come true. Because ultimately when you go somewhere, you want to bloom where you're planted. You want to be that person who can, who can uplift the people around you, even in some small way. And I think I was able to do that 
So to me, I'm incredibly grateful, and it's just been amazing. And you mentioned Coach Moten. What are your thoughts about him and having him as a coach for three years and being able to experience your college athletic career with him? You know, it's really unbelievable because I was a guy who no coach in the country, in Division One, no coach in the country had reached out to me and offered me a spot in their team. So I'll be forever indebted to Coach Moten because he gave me a chance. And not only did he give me a chance, he really believed in me. And that's really what's rare, especially in today's society. Having someone who believes in you when they really don't have to. We had no connections prior to this. He just saw the way I operated, appreciated me, and gave me a great opportunity. So I'll be forever indebted to him because it means the most for a guy who received no looks from any schools in the country to be able to go to a place where they have an unbelievable coach, an unbelievable program that wins and wins consistently and allows you to become a better version of yourself because that's what this program has done for me. I've become a better version of myself throughout the time here. Everybody know like he's a basketball, like he's, he, like he got a great basketball mind. So, you know, just off of that, he's a, he's a great coach. But, you know, outside of that, I feel like he's a great guy too. You know, like even like, you know, as I'm graduating and getting, like getting ready to leave here, like he's still trying to do everything he can to help me. So, you know, I'm appreciative of that because, you know, a lot of times, you know, schools, you know, after after kids graduate, the coaches probably, you know, won't try to help their kids, like, get a job or anything like that. They'll just, you know, basically kick them to the curb. But, you know, I'm thankful that Mo didn't do that with me. You transferred in, you sat out the year, and you watched the team go 16-0, and and you got to be a part of a team that went 13-3. and What made those guys so special? Just the camaraderie that we had being together. Uh, you know, we had a couple new guys mixed with a couple guys that have been there. So when I feel like it was just like a perfect mixture of both. Like it wasn't too many new guys to where like two old guys is trying to get 11 new guys to buy into what, you know, they've been doing when they were on teams that were successful. So it was kind of tough uh, my junior year speaking, but my senior year was like a perfect mixture. We had a couple new guys, Delvo, Big Will, that didn't really know, you know, how things worked per se on the court, but they, they got the, the gist of it off the court. But we had a, got a lot of returners, me, Dewan Graff, Rashawn Madison, uh, Kyle Bitten. Um, uh, it was a couple more that was coming off the bench, but it was, a, it was just a perfect mixture of guys. And I think it, it just meshed well my senior year. It was like we let them know how things worked and they was willing to buy in and it just worked perfectly. And for you being a player in this program, coaching here for over 10 years now, in your eyes, what makes this program so special? Uh, it was it's, it was special long before I even set foot here. Uh, it was it was special when John McClendon touched here, and you know I don't even consider myself the head coach. I just consider myself a caretaker of the program. Um, you know I had the fortunate opportunity to, to to meet him on several occasions, and when I was a player, he came to our practices, and I couldn't even practice because I knew about the history, and I just like, always had one eye on him. Um, but I thought it was phenomenal what he did, especially during that time when it was the Jim Crow segregation era, um, but still able to um, recruit and still able to uh, not use anything as excuses, but yet establish a program where he um, demands greatness from his players and he raised the bar to a standard of excellence. So we've just tried to fulfill those shoes. We always take it up a notch. Even if we having a good practice, he gonna always take it up a notch. Like we can never just stay like, you know what I'm saying, like here with it. It's always gonna be, you know what I'm saying, going up, going up, going up. So I feel like like that's the reason why we win a lot. It's the love that we have for one another. It's, it goes beyond the resources. It goes beyond the resources of the Duke, the UNCs. We, we love each other here. I mean, the bond that we have with our brothers who we fight with every single day the practices, that's what separates us. Teams don't practice the way we do. You know, Coach Moden holds us to a standard. The standard is the standard. That's a great saying, but we actually live that. There isn't a practice where he's not out on the floor holding us accountable. And I think that's very rare among coaches, especially coaches who could easily say, you know, I've accomplished this, let me relax a little bit. He knows his success is gonna come, but it's like, how do I get these guys from all these different places, maybe two-year transfer, three-year transfer, uh, under-recruited, over-recruited, uh, never got a shot, and how do I get them to mesh to come together for one goal? 
And it's like, none of this success would be possible without that man um, being here. So it all starts with Coach Moe. From McClendon to Mike Bernard to my coach, Greg Jackson, and uh, I just feel a responsibility to continue to carry it until I can't carry it in anymore. What's it like taking the floor and playing here at home? Uh, it's fun. The fans, the fans, they get pretty crunk when they come. So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a pretty live um, atmosphere. My junior year, it was easy. It could have been easy for that gym to be empty. It's all day because we weren't winning, you know, like consecutively like the year before. So it was like it was kind of tough and we would still come out and have a crowd. You know, so it was like those fans that just stick with us, is, it makes it real special because it make you want to go out and play even harder the next game for those for the fans and for the name behind the arena. I'll never forget my time spent here. I'll never really take it for granted because every single game you go out on the court, you know you have a great show in at home. And you know even when you go on the road, like I've said before, Norfolk, that Scope Arena has had more Central fans than just about any other fans. And to me, that's where we really shine our most. So, once again, just an incredible honor. It's just the name behind it. Uh, Coach Moten always talked about us, talked to us about knowing where you, you're, you're standing. Like, you can't be in here and not know who that man is. You know what I mean? So it's like, that's really what makes the gym special. Coach, in the postseason this year, there were many teams that had the shooting shirts on the bench that said family, but for this program, that's what the motto was all year long. And looking at the, the program, the team, coaching staff, and the North Carolina Central community, what does family mean to you in relation to this program? Family means everything. Um, family is someone that you may have uh, some disagreements with, even some squabbles. But when it's time to depend on that person, you know and that person know that you're gonna be there for each other, having each other back um, unequivocally. And that's what family means to me. It means loving uh, your brother. It means holding that brother accountable. And it means understanding that we're all fighting for one common goal. Not 25 common goals, but for one common goal. And there can't be any individual agendas the individual agendas must be thrown away and the common agenda must be um, championships and being great. And that's what family means to me, man. Like, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. All right, is there anything that you'd like to add here at the end about your time here? I mean, it was a good time. You know, I had fun. You know, we, we did it two years in a row. I and my team, my, I, myself and my teammates did it two years in a row. You know, previously my red shirt year, so that makes it three years in a row. So, I mean, you know, it was a wonderful time. You know, it was tough, but it was worth it at the end. So, you know, we got two rings out of it. So, yeah, that's it, man. It was just a great time. Um, it just was great, man. It's, you know, anybody, you know, watching this, I, I just want you and I just want people just to tell a friend about North Carolina Central because it's, a, it's really a beautiful campus and, you know, the people here are great. And you know, the sports programs are gonna continue to take off. So I just want people to just tell a friend to tell a friend about North Carolina Central. Number one, uh, Coach Moen for a great opportunity. I'd like to thank Dylan Stripe. He was a manager. He's, he's the reason I'm here as well. He is the one who contacted Coach Wilson and said, you know, I got a guy. Um, Dylan went to middle school with me and he's believed in me since day one. And he's sort of the reason I even had an opportunity initially. Um, by contacting Coach Wilson, getting me that tryout, allowing me to work summer camps where Coach Moen first met me. I got to thank him. Um, I also want to thank Pat Cole. Pat Cole, as you guys know, is, is and probably the best player I've ever played with on a team. Uh, from a talent perspective, from how he approached the game, without a doubt the best player I've played with. And he believed in me in such a way that I couldn't help but have confidence going forward. Uh, he was there for me that whole first year, and he's been there for me ever since. So I want to thank him. I also want to thank my family for um, supporting me in every game and showing up to just about every single game. They were there when I wasn't playing. They were there when I was starting. They were there when I was injured. And they were there for all three championships. So I just want to end by thanking my family, my dad, my mom, my brother, and my sister, as well as my other brother. All right, Coach, is there anything that you'd like to add? Nah, I'm good. Hey, go Eagles. <laughs>
Yeah.